Let's hear it for Ravi Zacharias. Thank you. Thanks, Pastor Jim. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. You know, the hazard of my life is answering questions. And when I was in my early 20s, and actually even in my teens, I used to have a lot of questions. And my mother would say to me, where on earth do you come up with these questions? And so it's kind of God's gag joke on me to help me spend the rest of my life dealing with people who have more questions than I have. <laughs> Did you hear of the fellow who had a bet with a friend of his? And he said, let's have a bet. I'll ask myself a question, and if I answer it, you pay me $100. He said, wait a minute, let me get this straight. You'll ask yourself a question, and if you answer it, I pay you $100. He said, yeah, but that's not it. He said, then I will ask myself, then you ask yourself a question, and if you answer it, I pay you $100. He said, what kind of bet is this? We keep asking ourselves questions, and if we answer it, you pay, you, we pay each other? He said, yeah, pretty simple. Isn't it fair? The guy said, okay. You ask yourself a question. If you answer it, I pay you $100. I ask myself a question. If I answer it, you pay me $100. We keep going till we ask ourselves a question we cannot answer. The fellow said, okay. So uh, he proposed, the one who proposed it started off with this. He said, how does a rabbit burrow a hole into the ground without throwing mud onto the outside. He said, that's my question to me. He said, and I answer it by saying the rabbit should start burrowing from the inside. The other guy says, how can it do that? He said, I don't know, that's your question. <laughs> <laughs> You know, sometimes we do ask ourselves questions which do stump us. In fact, what I'm going to tell you now is true. A few months ago, I was coming from Delhi to Atlanta, and there's a non-stop from Delhi to Newark with Continental Airlines. It's about 15 hours non-stop. You feel like should, you should have a few birthdays along the way. Uh, Pastor Jim just recently took the non-stop from here to Singapore, 18 and 35, 18 hours and 35. I've done that a few times, that's where I lost all my hair. But I was, I just landed in New York, it comes in around 6 in the morning, and uh, then 8.30 is the connecting flight to Atlanta. So I'd walked over to the gate where I was to make the connecting flight, and there was a different flight put on the marquee not the one to Atlanta, so I said, I hope not. So there was a lady sitting at the end, and I said, excuse me, ma'am, it says such and such a flight to this city. Is the flight from here going to Atlanta, or is it going there? She said, oh, it's, it's going to Atlanta. I said, good, just want to make sure, and then I trotted off to get myself a cup of coffee, and I heard this patter of feet behind me, and it was the lady. She came running after me. She said, excuse me, are you Ravi Zacharias? I said, yes. She said, I've heard you on the radio. I didn't know you had questions also. <laughs> I said, I always do, especially when I'm heading home. I don't mind getting on the wrong flight outbound, but I don't want to get the wrong on the wrong flight homeward bound. Now, have you ever been asked this question how do I choose my pleasures? You know, everywhere I go, they want me to deal with the problem of pain. Where was God during the tsunami? As Jim said, last time I was at Columbia. Where is God when it hurts? Disappointment with God. The answer to the problem of pain. We see pain as God's thorn in our flesh. C.S. Lewis says God whispers to us in our pleasures and he shouts to us in our pain. All of our theology sometimes rests on the ability to answer that one question, why is there so much of evil and suffering in this world? 
I can just about guarantee you this. In any open forum, if I were to write down 20 questions that would be raised at the end of the talk, this is bound to be one of them, if not the one as the nerve that answers, that connects to everything else. I know of so many people who say they've had a hard time believing in God because of the problem of pain. Now, may I suggest to you that possibly an even more difficult question is the problem of pleasure. And I'll try to sustain that for you in a way that might surprise you. And what I want to do, ladies and gentlemen, is read for you three slightly extended ideas. And if you'll give me your undivided attention through those three readings, once we start to unpack it, it'll be much smoother sailing. But you're gonna have to listen very carefully to these three sets of ideas. The first one, of course, I lift right from the scripture, and that's easy for you to follow. Here's Solomon asking this question. Now, isn't it surprising? This is not being asked by Job. This is being asked by Solomon, who was that quintessential representative of success, music, proverbs, psalms, pleasure, wisdom, everything. And here's what he says. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish. And what does pleasure really accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I want to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all of this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all of my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. It was a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Now the key phrase in that reading are those last three words, under the sun. It is a Hebraism. It is a kind of a proverbial reference to the idea when God is locked out. You sort of shut the heavens out of your life and you're in this closed system of three score years and 10. And he said, I did all of these things. I was the envy of people. Remember what the Queen of Sheba said when she'd finished visiting with him? Not even the half of it is known of what this man knows. And yet he says, when I'd finished all of this, it was like a chasing after the wind. This is not Job speaking. He said, everything became meaningless. I found I couldn't hold on to anything. Now, that is an easier part to understand. Let me read for you somewhat from an old English writer. When I say old English, I mean he writes more in the traditional, classical sense of the language. He actually happens to be one of my favorite writers. His name is F.W. Boreham, B-O-R-E-H-A-M. He's written over 50 volumes of essays, brilliantly done. He'll take a single little idea, write about eight or nine pages in it, and then anchor it in the Word of God at the end. Here is an essay of his called Phoebe's Perplexity from a book of his called Wisps of Wildfire. 
Here's what he says. Laughter, merriment, and fun were quite evidently intended to occupy a large place in this world. Yet on no subject under the sun has the church displayed more embarrassment and confusion. One might almost suppose that here we have discovered an important phase of human experience on which Christianity is criminally reticent, a terra incognita which no intrepid prophet had explored, a silent sea upon whose waters no ecclesiastical adventurer had ever burst, a dark and eerie country upon which no sun had ever shone. Dr. Jowett tells us of the devout old Scotsman who on Saturday night locked up the piano and unlocked the organ, reversing the process the last thing on the Sabbath evening. The piano is the sinner, the organ is the saint. Dr. Parker used to wax merry at the man who regarded table games as a gift from heaven, whilst billiards he deemed to be a stepping stone to perdition. The play we condemn, it is anathema to us, the same player of vastly inferior ones screened on a film we delightedly admire. One Christian follows the round of gaiety with the maddest of Mary. Another wears a hair shirt and starves himself into a skeleton. One treats life as all a frolic, another as all a funeral. We swerve from the scylla of asceticism to the charybdis of asceticism. We swing like a pendulum from the indulgence of the Epicurean to the severities of the Stoic, failing to recognize with the author of Ecce Homo that it is the glory of Christianity while rejecting the absurdities of each, it combines the cardinal excellencies of both. We allow without knowing why we allow. We ban without knowing why we prohibit. We compound for sins we are inclined to by damning those we have no mind to. We are at sea without chart or compass. Our theories of pleasure are in hopeless confusion. Is there no definite doctrine of amusement? Is there no philosophy of fun? There must be, there has to be. Thank God there is. So here is the writer Solomon raising the question at the end of his journey into pleasure. Here is a writer of English vintage who says we are so criminally reticent in trying to understand this, a terra incognita, an unknown terrain. We have supposedly entered the high seas without chart or compass on guiding us on how to select our pleasures. Neil Postman, who wrote the book Amusing Ourselves to Death, compares the two philosophies of Orwell, who wrote 1984, and Huxley, who wrote Brave New World. Listen to this brilliant paragraph he gives in the introduction. What George Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we'd be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared that the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared that we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture, preoccupied with the sum equivalent of the feelies, the orgy-porgy and the centrifugal bumble puppy. As Huxley remarked in Brave New World Revisited, the civil libertarians and rationalists who are ever on the alert to oppose tyranny fail to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. In 1984, people are controlled by inflicting pain. In Brave New World, they're controlled by inflicting pleasure. In short, Orwell feared that what we hate will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. This says, says Neil Postman, is about the possibility that Huxley and not Orwell was right. You hear what he's saying? It's not pain that is ultimately going to ruin our culture. It's unbridled pleasure where there are no boundaries set anymore, and we exhaust ourselves at the altar of sensually driven indulgences. Now, are there any parameters? Are there any guidelines? And I'm gonna to give to you three of them. 
They are very simple ones. And especially if you're a young person looking for some kind of uh, boundaries and, and fences to help guide you, take note of these and see if you can put them to the test in your life. You see, Solomon for 40 years wore the crown from the central time in Jewish history to the period of its highest glory and to its commencing decline. Every day he fed 14,000 people in his palace. He wrote 3,000 proverbs, 100 songs, and on and on and on. And he says at the end of it all, he asked himself the question, what did I accomplish? What did I accomplish? So may I give you three principles? None of these will you find explicitly in the passage I'm quoting to you, but my is it ever implicit in what is being said. All of these come in very strange settings. The first one comes in Judges chapter seven. You don't need to turn to it because you remember the story. It's the story of Gideon facing the Midianites and he wants to know how he's going to face such a daunting enemy. So he selects the maximum number for his army he can. He takes 32,000 of the choicest men. And then he goes to God and says, look, we've got a problem. I don't know how we're going to overcome them, but I've taken 32,000 men. Have you got any word of advice for me? God says, yes, you've got a bigger problem than you realize. This army is too big. I don't want 32,000 going with you. He said, all right, then what do I do? And he reduced it down to 10,000. God says, you've still got too many. He said, what are you doing with me, Lord? He says, bring him down. So I'm going to send 300 with you and that's all you're going to need. One shall chase a thousand. You just need 300. Now, how does he select them? He is told to take these men to a river where they are to kneel and drink water. And while they're in the process of drinking water, he said, you observe, there's going to be 300 who will drink in one particular way unknown to them and you select that, kind, that person, that's the one you need in your army. The rest of them, tell them they're on paid vacation, they can go back home and enjoy their families. Gideon is nervous, but he follows the Lord, and he selects 300. Now, the thing is, these men don't know what is going on. They kneel by the riverbank to drink water, and they are in a very normal process of getting their refreshment on the way to a battle. So here's the first principle. Anything that refreshes you without distracting you from diminishing or distracting you from your final goal is a legitimate pleasure. Anything that refreshes you without distracting you from diminishing or destroying your final goal is a legitimate pleasure. What's the covert point here? The point here is this, you first have to draw out what your final goal is. If you've not established that final purpose, you will never know what is going to refresh you along the way. You see, that's the problem with pleasure today. Most of us have not established a final purpose in life. Once you've established that, then you know what it is that can distract, diminish, or destroy you on your way to that purpose. Now, isn't it fascinating? Whenever you go to a company to work for them, they sit you down and give you their mission statement. What's the mission of this company? There was a commercial some time ago which was brilliant. They're all sitting around a table, and uh, they're talking about all the information problems they are having. This computer is breaking down, that machine is breaking down, this scanner is not functioning. They're going on and on and on. And one guy raises the question, what about the shirts? I say, what do you mean, what about the shirts? What about the shirts? I say, what do you mean, what about the shirts? He said, we sell shirts. And we've spending, we're spending every meeting dealing with our information technology. We don't talk about our shirts. How easy it is to be discussing all of the peripheral issues and losing sight of what it is that your life is about. Have you ever, ever 
sat down with a piece of paper and a pen in your hand and written down the mission statement for your life. Marriage you to do that. Take a blank sheet of paper at the end of today. If you've never done it, what is your mission statement in your life? May I tell you something? You will find this one way or the other haunting you if you have never clearly articulated this. You know, Susanna Wesley was the mother of 19 children. She herself came from a family of a mother that had 29, I think. They could have had their own church. And she was brilliant, raising in that family two giants in the faith, the great musician Charles and the great speaker and preacher John Wesley. You know, John wasn't more than barely five feet and change tall. He wasn't a daunting figure. If you go to his home in London and you look at his robe, you're not quite sure if it's an adult robe. He was not a big guy. And yet he traveled in his life having preached 40,000 sermons. You know, that's a lot of sermons. When Oswald J. Smith passed away in Toronto, Billy Graham gave him a tribute by saying he preached 12,000 sermons in his life. And that is an awful lot of sermons. But if you preach 12,000 sermons on the day of television and airplanes, 40,000 sermons on the day of horseback is almost unthinkable. That's why John Wesley was called one of the earliest versions of the Sermon on the Mount. He rode and rode and rode and preached and preached and preached. 40,000 sermons. He traveled over a quarter of a million miles preaching. He worked with 15 different languages. He produced over 600 pieces of literature, some of them massive tomes. At the age of 83, he was angry with his doctor because his doctor didn't let him preach more than 14 times a week. And at the age of 86, in his journal were written these words, laziness is slowly creeping in. There's an increasing tendency to stay in bed after 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> when I first read that, I said, he probably went to bed early. You know? because there were no lights or anything like that. One day he went to his mother and said this to her, give me a definition of sin. Give me a definition of sin. She gave, I think, the most profound definition I've heard. She said this, son, if anything weakens your reasoning, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes away your relish for spiritual things. In short, if anything increases the authority and the power of the flesh over the spirit, that to you, John, becomes sin, however good it is in itself. <laughs> if anything weakens your reasoning, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes away your relish for spiritual things. In short, if anything increases the authority and the power of the flesh over the spirit, that you become sin, however good it is in itself. Is it any surprise that the man went on to become the famous, profound teacher of the gospel to thousands and thousands of people? You know, when I was growing up in India, Delhi became my home. My father worked for the Indian government. And I'd never heard the gospel. Sad to say, I went to a church, but I'd never heard the gospel there. And part of the problem may have been mine, because I had no interest. I loved cricket, and I always wanted to be on the cricket field. In fact, I memorized most of the Anglican prayer book, not because I was so devout, but that helped me to time how much more time was left for the service to be over. I could tell you exactly when there were seven minutes left. It was when the vicar would say, that let us therefore now draw near by faith. And I'd look at my watch and say, we're gonna be, we're gonna be out of here in seven minutes. And as I was in that church Sunday after Sunday, missing the beauty of the prayer book, and it drove my life ultimately from the cricket field and elsewhere to those of you who read my story in walking from east to west to a bed of suicide where I had finally in a 
marvelous act of God's grace found Christ. I remember there was a day when I attended a summer camp where God laid his claim on my life. There were only about 50 of us young people in our teens. And when the preacher gave the invitation as what we would call at that time total surrender or total commitment, I walked forward. Almost everybody had come. There was, I think, no more than two or three of them who had refused to come. I remember that so well. A couple of sisters, pretty tough in resisting this. They thought we were all being duped. And I, I was 20 years old when my father left for India and we moved to Canada. And I'd settled down in Toronto. Many, many years went by. And I would say maybe 15 or so. And I was back in Delhi preaching. And the mother of these two girls gave me a call. And I was with my brother-in-law, who was also in that group, who was also a new Christian at that time, who became a nuclear physicist, and then went on to answer the call, and is today a pastor in Toronto. It was both of us together preaching in Delhi. And this lady called me and said, would you two please come and visit my daughter, the older of my two girls, and she named her. She said, do you remember her? I said, of course I remember her said, Ravi, would you please come? I said, I'll bring Sundar with me. Is it okay? And she said, please do. We came there to the house, not realizing what we were walking into. And we, the door was open, and they, to, we were told she's upstairs lying in a bed. We both walked upstairs, and what greeted us was a terrifying sight. This girl, whom we'd known as a lovely young college kid when we left, same as our age, was twisted up like this in bed, her face totally sunken, and needles all over her. I said, what on earth are we seeing? She said she had an argument with me, took an overdose of some drugs, didn't kill her. This is what is done to her. My daughter's a vegetable. You know, as a young person, when you grow up, you don't know very much of what just a few years ahead may bring for you. And as I saw her laid up like that, I called her by name. I said, do you remember me? Whether she understood or not, I don't know, but all kinds of gurgling sounds came out of her and just the, 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 the spit coming out of the side of her saliva, coming out of the side of her mouth, and she just writhed and writhed. I just held her bony arm and desperately prayed that whatever God had in mind, even in this awful situation, he would shine some light in that room in a dark place. When you make your choice, when you make your choices, it comes as a package deal. And the package deal is to walk the way of God and to determine whether your will is going to be surrendered to him or you're going to try and straddle the lines and play half of life your way and half of life his way. And you find out at the end that ought not to have been the way it was. You know, the Bible says this. It is fascinating to me. Moses wrote 613 laws. David reduced them to 15. Isaiah comes down to 11. Micah brings them down to three to do justice, love, mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. When Jesus was asked what is the greatest commandment, I am amazed that he didn't give them one. He gave them two. Because the two are inextricably bound. One gives you the basis for the next, and the second gives you the imperative from the first. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all of the laws and the prophets. What I say to you is, however you set your purpose in life, take this commandment into mind as you are writing out that ultimate purpose. For this is the will of God for your life and mine in the broadest terms and whatever purpose you establish cannot violate these two commandments. And so I leave you with this first thought that you are to always remember who you are, 
why he made you and to establish the characteristics that it takes to go and attain that ultimate goal and that ultimate purpose. And on the basis of that, anything that refreshes you will not distract, diminish, or destroy your ultimate goal as a refreshment along the way. There's an old Greek mythological story of a man by the name of Sophronius who had a daughter by the name of Eulalia and a handsome guy who was the playboy in town by the name of Lucinda asked her out for a night. And the father pleaded with her not to go. Lucinda did not have a good name. He had had a reputation of destroying many a young life. And she said, I'm going to go. He said, I beg you don't. She said, I will. He said, all right, do me one favor before you go. Just walk over to that fireplace and take one of those coals in your hand for just 30, for just a brief moment here. She said, why do you want me to do that? He said, just do that. He says, the fire is gone. It won't burn you. She said, I know it won't burn me, but it could stain me. He said, that's what I'm trying to tell you. One night may not destroy you in the company of the wrong person, but it could show stain you and show mark you in a way that you'd wished you'd never entered into that friendship on that given night. And so I say to you, I have absolutely no doubt that an audience this size, there are some of you with whom that story connected. It was an evening, it was a night, it was a date, it was a habit, it was a conversation that has stained you permanently from that day till now. And so I say to you, anything that refreshes you without distracting you from diminishing or destroying the final goal is a legitimate goal. And as I stood by the side of that young woman in Delhi, the thought that kept swarming my mind was this, what are you doing in this condition? What are you doing in this condition? And there but for God's grace, many of us would be in a very similar situation. Principle number one I've given you. Number two, David is at Adullam, the Philistines at Rephaim, and they are about to face a big battle again. And David is sitting there with his army and he is tired. And he says to himself, oh, if I could only have a drink of water from my well in Bethlehem. Oh, if I could only have a drink of water from my well in Bethlehem. How refreshing that would be. Have you ever felt that in your heart? Some longing for a moment of simple refreshment? You know, uh, I traverse this globe much more than I probably should have. Sometimes well over 200 days a year, and the body carries the marks of that. And many, many times I have gone to bed at night 10, 15,000 miles away, and I'm sure my brother Jim would sympathize, and many of you who are traveling for your profession have gone to bed at night and you feel the tears trickle down the side of your face and you wish desperately you were at home. Oh, to be home. Oh, to have a simple meal at the table with my family rather than all this grand food set in array in front of me in this beautiful hotel. I don't know how many times in the early days when I would come back from my travels, I'd put my bags down and kiss the kitchen floor. It was so nice to be home again. So nice to be home. David has a very reasonable wish. Oh, if only I could get a drink of water from Bethlehem in the middle of this battle. Three of his choicest warriors hear this wish. They make their way in a cloak and dagger operation, get behind the Philistine garrison, get to Bethlehem, fill out a pitcher of water, and they come back. They bring it back to David, and David is surprised. He said, what's this? He said, this is water from your well in Bethlehem, David. We love you. You're our general. 
we want to give this to you. This was your wish. David is quite overwhelmed by this. He picks up the pitcher and is about to drink and he stops. He says, no, I simply cannot indulge in this selfish desire having risked the lives of three of my choicest soldiers. So he lifts that pitcher rather than to his mouth. He empties it onto the ground and thereby telling them, your life was of greater value to me than my simple pleasure of drinking this water. Don't do this for me again. You know what the principle is? Any pleasure that jeopardizes the sacred right of another is an illicit pleasure for you. Think of all of Old Testament history, how different it would have been if David had reacted the same way when he set eyes upon Bathsheba. From 1000 BC onwards, the nation spiraled down when you saw the untamed passions of a gifted man. He was unable at that point to stop the seduction that was there for his eyes. You know, the old adage holds true. You sow a thought and you reap an act. You sow an act and you reap conduct. You sow conduct, you reap character. You sow character and you reap a destiny. I wonder how many times David himself sat down, possibly when he saw the tragedy with Absalom and with Solomon and think to himself, what have I wrought? What have I done? In Psalm 51, he said, let the bones which you have broken rejoice. He felt like a man with shattered bones holding him up. The fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the subtlest of all principles. And just in case you and I think we have not done what David did, we've not taken what belonged to another man, let me ask you this, how many times has your calling and your profession caused you to compromise and sacrifice those to whom you owe something by virtue of your commitment, I mean principally your family? Listen to me very carefully now. It doesn't matter what you do in your calling right now. I want you to hear me. Whatever you're calling, at some point, it'll test your character. Whatever you're calling. I've had it tested so many times, and some of them I have failed. For example, I wish so much that I could begin this itinerant life all over again. There are many, many times where I stepped out of that door where I wouldn't now. You think, you think you're doing it, everything for a noble cause, and it was. But there was a debt to be paid and an honor that was due to those who became compromised and sacrificed along the way. Anything, any pleasure that jeopardizes the sacred right of another is an illicit pleasure. Have you ever felt that in your job? What it took from you? What it extracted from you? You may not have been aware of it, but the world has a way of closing in, in a way that your calling becomes the primary thing and your character becomes compromised in the process. Minerth and Meyer, who wrote the book, Happiness is a Choice, make this comment. As a point of clarification, Dr. Minerth and I are convinced that many people do choose happiness, but never obtain it. The reason for this is that even though they choose to be happy, they seek for inner peace and joy in wrong places. They seek for happiness in materialism and do not find it. They seek for joy in sexual prowess, but end up with fleeting pleasures and bitter long-term disappointments. They seek inner fulfillment by obtaining positions of power in corporations and government, 
or even in their own families by exercising excessive control, but they remain totally unfulfilled. I have had millionaire businessmen come to my office and tell me they have big houses, yachts, condominiums in Colorado, nice children, a beautiful mistress, an unsuspecting wife, secure corporate positions, and yet live with suicidal tendencies. They have everything this world has to offer except one thing, inner peace and joy. They come to my office as a last resort, begging me to help them conquer the urge to kill themselves. Why? The answers are not simple. The human mind and emotions are a very complex, dynamic system. Let me give you two illustrations of this and then move to my final thought. You'll have to forgive me if you see me hobbling a bit. Day after tomorrow marks one year since my second back surgery and Jim was so kind last night, he asked me how I was doing and I was doing very well. I don't know what I did to my back this morning, but it's sent me into spasms right in the mid back. And I've been struggling, struggling just to get some stretching so that it goes away. I hope it'll take two or three days and it'll be gone, but I'm okay as I walk, just uh, don't let my little bit of limp distract you here. When I was in Thailand about six weeks ago, I was there writing and I was in a different hotel because I know too many people in the hotel where I was staying and uh, normally stay and I thought before my wife joined me, I'll be in a quiet spot where nobody will know and I'll just keep writing morning, noon and night. But word spreads, that's the price you pay for being too friendly with the waiters. And somehow word got back to the hotel I always use that I was in town. And I got a call. I got a call from somebody who was an employee there and says, Ravi, would you do me a favor? He said, there's a very well-known actor from America staying at our hotel and he's in despair. Despair. And I talked to him about you. I heard you were in town. Would you be willing to come and just have a breakfast with him? I, kn I knew the name. I didn't know he was an Academy Award winner. If I gave the name to you, you'd know his name very well. And uh, I so she said, here's his cell number. He wants you to call him. So I called him. I said, is this urgent? Can it wait for three or four days? My wife will be there. Actually, I'm moving into that hotel. He said, that's fine. Let's do it when you come, when your wife's arrived and you and I can sit down at breakfast. We did, and for about one hour during this little breakfast, I couldn't get a word in. He was just so full of talk, full of all kinds of complaints in life, and then ultimately how his life had been so shattered. I won't give you any more details than that. And I knew he wasn't ready to listen to me. So I just took him, took his wrist in my hand and I said, do you mind if I pray for you first? He looked kind of startled. He'd started following some Tibetan monk and became very mystical in his belief system and all of that. I said, we'll deal with that. Do you mind if I pray for you? He said, yes, please. I prayed for him. I said, Lord, would you restore to this man the years that the locusts have eaten? When I finished, this big, strikingly handsome looking man, the tears were running down his face. He was willing to listen. He texts me now, every now and then, and signs off by saying, God bless you, friend. God bless you, friend. He's still possibly very far from the kingdom. Almost exactly 10 days to the day, I was back in Atlanta, and uh, suddenly, not 10 days, a few days after that, I was back. Another actor wanted to know if he could come and say hello. He wanted to say something. He sat across the table and he told me, you'll never know what difference your books and your CDs have made in my life. And he unfolded a story of horrific things in his family. 
And as I listened to these two icons, it became so obvious to me, as it has to you many times, those who come on celluloid and on screens or who put on uniforms because they are particularly gifted in one sport, we set them up as the idols of our time. Many of them are living with broken hearts, broken dreams, shattered visions of a future because they've had everything they could buy except the inner peace that they desperately long for. <laughs> Do you know why? Do you know why? The Bible says this in the book of Psalms, to all perfection there is a limit but the laws of the Lord are boundless. The first time I read that, I thought to myself, no, 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 they've got this wrong. To all perfection, there's a limit, but the laws of the Lord are boundless. Ought it not to be the reverse? That to all laws, there's a limit, but perfection is boundless? No. The reason he tells us that the laws of the Lord are boundless is this. When you do things God's way, it is a perpetual novelty, and there's a boundlessness to the delight of doing it God's way. <laughs> Think of what's happened in America today. We don't know when life begins. We don't know what marriage means. We do not know what sexuality means, and we are going to do it our way. The most atheistic country in the world is Albania. And when I finished addressing the members of parliament there, the president asked if I could come and visit his home. He's a cardiologist. This big man, Facing the floor, along with a couple of my colleagues, he turns to me and he says, he says, Dr. Zacharias, he says, we are the most atheistic country in the world, and we have made one mess of this country. He said, maybe it's time for us to stop doing it our way and start thinking of doing it God's way. And we in America are going to try to stop doing it God's way and start doing it our way. The handwriting's on the wall. You desacralize life, you desacralize sexuality, you desacralize marriage, ultimately you desacralize the nation itself. It's a serious thing before us. It's a serious thing before us. And what I say to you is very critical in trying to understand this. Any pleasure that jeopardizes the sacred right of another is an illicit pleasure. Which takes me to the last one, which is quite brief, and you'll understand it because it's so blunt. Proverbs 25, 16. If you find honey, eat just enough, too much of it, and you'll vomit. The Lord says it like it is. And Solomon said it like it is. Too much of honey and you're gonna be sick and throw up. You know what that means? Any pleasure, however good, if not kept in balance, will distort reality or destroy appetite. Any pleasure, however good, if not kept in balance, will distort reality or destroy appetite. I love to play tennis, at least I did before I had metal rods in my back. But I could never play tennis holding my wife's hand at the same time. They belonged in two different settings. There's a place to hold the hand, there's a place to hold the racket. And you must keep pleasure in balance. You can't be in church the whole time. You come to be blessed to go out and be a light to the world. All pleasures must be kept in balance, and the balanced life is the hardest life to lead. There's a time to weep, there's a time to laugh, there's a time to play, there's a time to come home, there's a time to work, there's a time to celebrate, 
There's a time to give. There's a time to receive. God has appointed time in various ways that brings about the multiplicities of his demands and his blessings in our lives. Now, I've given you three principles. You first establish your goal, and then anything that distracts you from that is an illegitimate one. Anything that jeopardizes the sacred right of another is an illicit pleasure. And any pleasure that is not kept in balance will distort reality or destroy appetite. I want to bring to you four conclusions from my message. Very important. Conclusion number one, all pleasure must be bought at the price of pain. Hear that? All pleasure must be bought at the price of pain. The difference between false and true pleasure is this. For true pleasure, the price is paid before you enjoy it. For false pleasure, the price is paid after you enjoy it. For true pleasure, the price is paid before you enjoy it, the discipline of knowing when to say no. It hurts. You walk into a path of an illicit relationship, maybe easy to do, and the price you will pay is after that. If you say no from the beginning, it's painful, but you enjoy the legitimate pleasures of what God gives to you, okay? <laughs> Number two, it is this, that meaninglessness, please listen to me, these are the words of Chesterton. Please hear me very carefully. Meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes from being weary of pleasure. That's why I say to you it is the most important, more important of the two questions. Nobody is so fed up with life as the one who's exhausted pleasure. Some of the loneliest people in the world are those who have lived indulgent lives and emotionally and physically drive themselves to impotence. It just has that stigma of emptying itself in the wrong way. You know, I wrote a book on an imaginary conversation between Jesus and Oscar Wilde, and it's called Sense and Sensuality. And Oscar Wilde was the epitome of pleasure seekers. He introduced the philosophy of dandyism. They said when he walked into a room, everybody saw the flamboyant personality of Oscar Wilde. He was an artist with words, brilliant in his plays, exquisite in his poetry. His book, The Picture of Dorian Gray, is a fascinating story, very well written, and Wilde the playwright. Oscar Wilde indulged and indulged and indulged, and at the age of 40 or so, snuffed his life out, in a sense. And as he lay in a hotel room in Paris, which I visited, this man who had lived with the motto that there is no boundary for pleasure, looked at his lover by his bedside and said to him this, please bring me a priest. And in his poem, The Ballad of Reading Jail, he said, none but Christ is big enough now to cure this weary heart of mine. You know, meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness ultimately will come from being weary of pleasure. That's the second application. The third application is this. The closer you get to pure pleasures, the closer you get to the heart of God. The closer you get to impure pleasures, the farther you move from the heart of God. Can I repeat that? The closer you get to pure pleasures, the closer you get to the heart of God. The farther you move from pure pleasures or move towards impure pleasures, the farther you get away from the heart of God. Let me illustrate that. C.S. Lewis in his book Screwtape Letters has an older devil training a junior devil on how to seduce people. And so he refers to anybody who follows God 
as God is the enemy. And so he tells this junior devil, the senior devil does, how to go and seduce this man who's getting too close to the enemy, getting too close to God. He tells him to go and the younger devil's job is to seduce this man away from God and bring him closer to their way of thinking. So the junior devil proceeds and he goes about it, but he fails and he comes back and says, we lost him. And the senior one says, what did you do? He said, I didn't do anything. He said the problem was he did two things every day. He would wake up early in the morning and take a nice, long, relaxing walk. And during those walks, the enemy would speak to him. He says then at the end of each day, he would read a good book. And when he read those good books, the enemy would speak to him. The senior devil says, do you see your mistake? When he took those long walks, you should have put it into his mind to do it for a physical exercise, and he would have begun to despise it. Unfortunately, you allowed him to enjoy a beautiful walk just for the sake of the walk. And you should have put into his mind to read these good books so that he can quote it to somebody else like I am doing now. He said, unfortunately, you allowed him to enjoy a good book. He should have just, you should have just prompted him to keep reading and reading so he could quote it to someone else and it would become very laborious and never filtered in. You made a big mistake. You made a big mistake. You see, you allowed him to get too close to the enemy by enjoying such good legitimate pleasures. When you do the beautiful things of life, you draw closer to the heart of God. Feel a flower. Touch the face of a little child. My wife is gonna say, um, she's gonna hold me to this next one. Stroke a dog. We have a 150 pound great Pyrenees. He is marvelous. He's majestic. And when you just run your finger through that fur of his, you feel a little bit of God's creation. You know, do beautiful things. Read good books. More than anything else, read the word. That's the third application. And the fourth thing I say to you is this. Do you know what your heart longs for? Do you know what your heart longs for? It longs for an intimacy that touches both body and soul. Communion is one of those acts where you feel, taste, touch, remember, and look forward to his coming again the hope that God will give you in worship. Let me pull this together with a definition and an illustration and I'm through. You know what the greatest search of philosophy has been? To find unity in diversity. That's why every American coin has the words e pluribus unum, out of the plurality, singularity out of diversity, unity. That's why universities were built, by the way, to find unity in diversity. The greatest search of the human heart is to find unity in diversity. You will never find it until you find the thrill and the privilege of worshiping him. For worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It's the quickening of conscience by his holiness, nourishment of mind by his truth, purifying of imagination by his beauty, opening of the heart to his love, and submission of will to his purpose. And all this gathered up in adoration is the greatest expression of which we are capable. Can I repeat that? Quickening of conscience by his holiness, nourishment of mind by his truth, purifying of imagination by his beauty, 
opening of the heart to his love, and submission of will to his purpose. All this gathered up in adoration is the greatest expression of which we are capable. That's why the music, that's why the message, that's why the fellowship, that's why the giving, that's why the community, that's why the evangel, that's why the distribution of the truth, it pulls together everything in the singular skin that I am the Lord your God who has rescued you and delivered you, therefore you shall have no other gods before me. This singular vision directs everything in your life. I was telling Pastor Jim and the friends last night at dinner that about two weeks ago I was in Syria speaking and straight from there went to Cairo. And I was, my hotel was right by the River Nile. In Damascus, we walked by the old city where Paul was put into a basket and dropped over to become the missionary to the Gentile world. As I looked at the Nile, I couldn't help but think of Moses in a basket. I said, Lord, really, you've taken me to two cities and the story of two baskets. A man who gave us one third of the New Testament and a man who gave us the Pentateuch and gave us the Ten Commandments and 1 Corinthians 13. Do you know how to worship him? Alone? You know, because I've been so guilt-ridden from my earlier years on my 50th birthday, my wife asked me, what do you want for your birthday? I really didn't want anything. I said, you know, honey, what I'd love? I'd love an old Anglican prayer bench because I went to church so many times and had no interest in what was going on. I want a prayer bench so I can kneel every day before God and get my right life right before him. She's a sleuth that way. She found one from somewhere. And in my study downstairs, I have this old prayer bench with a Bible on it. It looks out of a window. It's where my day begins, on your knees before God. And then you face the day. You miss that time with him, and the day is too overbearing for you. You'll have to forgive me if you're familiar with this story, but I have to close with it. It's part of my notes. <laughs> and I don't want the notes to be offended for not copying them. When I was 25, if you haven't heard it, this will bless you beyond measure. If you have heard it, this is what my Christian and Missionary Alliance background would say, it's the second blessing. When I was 25, I was a student in theology in Toronto and a missionary to Vietnam who was the daughter of the famed Jonathan Goforth of China, the missionary. She asked me if I'd go to Vietnam and preach to the American troops and to the churches there. I was still in my 20s, still my, had one more year uh, to finish my studies. But for some reason, God laid it on her heart to ask me to do that, and I did. So I went and spent four months in Vietnam my last summer. Some kind soul covered all the costs and then my fees for the following year in order to do that. Over 3,000 came to Christ in those four months, and the revival in Vietnam was triggered. And I say that kindly because we were two young guys. My interpreter was 17. I was 25. Our cumulative age was 42. This guy was powerful. He had been an interpreter for the American troops and he knew all the slang. There were times in the middle of my message where he'd put his arm out and tell me to stop, enough, enough, the blessing is already enough. And he'd just plead with them to repent at that moment because they didn't need to hear anymore. It's true, very true. After, after my four months, Hien is a, not a big guy, diminutive guy. 
always call me Brother Rafi, Brother Rafi. We were on motorbikes, we were in helicopter gunships, we were in C-130s, that's how we covered the country. When I bid goodbye to him in Saigon and wrapped my arms around him, I said, you're a brother in the Lord, I don't know if I'll ever see you again. We embraced, we wept, and we said goodbye. 17 years later, I was in Vancouver, British Columbia preaching when at 11 at night my phone rang. Is that Brother Rafi? I said, him? He said, how did you guess? I said, where on earth are you calling from? He said, I'm in California. I said, you are? He said, yeah, I'm going to Berkeley. I said, what? I said, what's happened since I saw you? Never heard from you. He said, have you got a few minutes? I said, I've got all the time you want. He said, after you left, within a few months, as you know, Vietnam fell to the communists. He said, they arrested me. They knew of my time with you. They knew of my time with the American uh, soldiers and all. They took, put me in prison. They told me I worked for the CIA. So I told him, no, I've never worked for the CIA. I just translated for people. He said they would have none of it. They kept me there day in and day out. He said, Brother Ravi, it was miserable. First of all, because they blocked me off from English, which was the only thing in which I could have read some of the books I'd owned and wanted to about following Christ. They blocked me off from every English book. I could only read in Vietnamese or French. So they gave me marks and angles, marks and angles, marks and angles, morning, noon, and night. It finally got through. He said, Brother Rafi, I thought of you many times. I said, maybe what he taught was not true. He said, I began to lose my grip on God. He said, one night I went to bed and I said, God, I'm not sure you really exist and if I'm wasting my time talking to you. All I know is, this is it. This is it. And he said, I went to bed that night saying, I'm never going to pray again, never going to think of God again. He said, I went to bed, woke up the next morning, the commanding officer was with me and said, I want you to clean the latrines today. He said, Brother Rafi, you've never seen a latrine like those latrines in those prisons. He said, I used to take a piece of cloth and cover my mouth and take buckets and water or sloshing all over the place. He said, as I was emptying one dirty tin can with used toilet paper, used paper and human excrement on it. As I was emptying it out, I thought I saw one piece of paper was in English. So I looked around, nobody was there. I took this paper quickly, washed it off and put it into my hip pocket. He said, went to bed, my bed that night when all of my roommates were asleep under my mosquito net, I took out my flashlight and I looked at it. On the right-hand corner it said, Romans chapter eight. <laughs> and we know that in all things, that all things work together for good to them that love God, that are called according to his purpose. For who shall separate us from the love of God Neither life, nor death, nor thing. He said, Brother Rafi, I cried and cried in my room and I was covering my face with my pillow so nobody would hear me. I said, Lord, you didn't let me out of your reach for even one day. He said, I went back to the commanding officer the next day and said, do you mind if I clean the latrines again today? He said, I went and brought back Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 10. <laughs> he said, I offered to clean the latrines every day and then I found out the commanding officer had been given a Bible. He would tear pages and use it as toilet paper. I was bringing it back, washing it and having my devotions. They finally released him. He's a smart guy. He started to build a boat with 52 others and one high-level government officer's daughter was part of it to get out of there. About four days before he was to leave and the boat was being built and he described to me how he hid this boat. He said, try hiding a boat. 
He said, four men came armed and said, Hien, are you escaping from this country? No, no, no. You're not trying to leave? No, no. Are you telling us the truth? Yeah, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. And they just shook him up a bit and left. Somebody told us you're trying to escape. He said, no, that's not true. After they went, he said, I got on my knees and I prayed a prayer that I hoped God would never answer. I said, Lord, here I go again trying to do it my way. Lord, if you really want me to tell them the truth, bring them back before I go and I'll tell it to them. <laughs> Hours before his departure, these four boys showed up. And he said, this is at the end of the trail. They grabbed him by the collar, rammed him against a wall and said, you're lying. He said, yes. Along with 52 others. Are you going to put me behind bars again? They said, no, we want to go with you. Do you know what he said? Do you know what Hien told me? He said, Brother Rafi, when we got onto the high seas, we were torn in a storm. That boat would have capsized, but these four guys were brilliant mariners. They rescued our lives. He said, I was on my knees saying, there you are, there God, I brought 52 plus these four men, we're all going to go down. They rescued us. They arrived in Thailand, stayed in a refugee camp for a long time. He was declared a United Nations refugee. America took him in. He finished his studies at Berkeley. Today, he's a financial planner. I'm not sure he's happy he is, but he's a financial planner <laughs> in, the, in California. He flew to Atlanta to spend time with my wife and children and me because he wanted me to come and officiate at his wedding. He met a lovely Vietnamese gal he was going to marry. He looked at my kids and he said, you know, there are times in your life where you think you're completely in control and you can do whatever you want. He said, no. He said, your greatest search in life ends when you know that you are in the hands of God and you're safe there and he will guard you and keep you. And remember this, at his right hand, our pleasures forevermore. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for strength, for the power to think and to think things through. I thank you for this church. What a beautiful place this is. What a place of refuge, a place of sending, a place of hope. I thank you so much for the hundreds that work in this place, do things, for your glory from cleaning its floors to feeding those who are hungry to lifting their voices and singing I thank you for my dear brother Jim you've kept your hand upon him and his family and used him as a light in this world just as you're using this church Lord, I have no doubt that today some are wandering far afield in illicit pleasure. And you have spoken. Ladies and gentlemen, while your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to give you an invitation. But don't do this because it'll make somebody else happy. Do this because God has spoken to you. It may be that you have walked far away from his heart or you're dabbling in areas that you ought not to be dabbling in and today God has spoken to you to remind you with a loving voice come home to where you belong near to the heart of God 
if God has spoken to you very clearly today to get things right with him, maybe to know him for the first time, I'd love to pray with you as I close. But I want to do that, giving you the privilege for us to respond. You know, it was amazing to me in a country like Egypt to see people unafraid to stand and come by the hundreds to Christ. You're in a friendly audience here. Many love you, and you've been prayed for. While you're not looking around, but this is a moment between you and God, and you're giving me the privilege of sharing in it. And you want to say, yes, Ravi, God's spoken to me. I want to get right with him this afternoon. Would you stand where you are in that spot? Just rise to your feet. Thank you. God bless you. Yes, several of you, ground floor and upstairs, I see you. Please understand what this is about. This is a clear moment for you to say, I want to get right with him today. I'm not right with him right now. And God's brought me here for a reason. And he'll give you that strength. And he will take you onto new paths of righteousness. Don't fight it anymore. Let God win the victory. If you're nervous, turn to the person next to you and say, please stand with me. I need to settle this once and for all. Would you stand up right now, this last moment, as I give you the opportunity? God prompts you. Please do that. Yes, God bless you, sir, at the back and others, and upstairs to several of you. Eternal Father, strong to save. What a wonderful day this has been. What a wonderful two days it has been for us. For these who are standing, reinforce in their hearts tonight, today, that you love them. You are the hound of heaven following them. Change hearts, change habits, change hungers, and reclaim these lives or claim these lives for your honor. Lord, I don't know what the struggles are, but you do. Move through this sanctuary even now and let those who need to do this get right with you. Minister deeply and transformingly and eternally. Bless this place. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you. You may be seated.